We do not seem to have an introducer today, and so I will step in at the last <laughs> second here and just use this occasion to uh, notice that we're going to be hearing some interesting uh, discussion of something that's going to be very relevant to the future here at KAIPAC. It's Ruben and how we can get science done with this amazing new facility that's coming on. So, um, well, having not prepared any detailed biography, I'm not ready to speak to all the uh, accolades, but we will be hearing about the results of a study of how to get a community together to get something out of Roman. So let's go ahead and get started. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Okay, terrific. Uh, thanks. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Larry Gladney. Uh, I was last here maybe 20 years ago, and then before that, um, another 20 years back as a graduate student here. And I'm back this time to talk to you about something that's a little different for a science talk, which is how do we actually get science done, and who do we get to actually do the science. I'm going to try to convince you that there is a real question here, uh, and it's the question that's posed here, who gets to discover the unknown, is really about a, uh, a problem that we actually understand has been a problem, or if you don't see that it's a problem, you probably never will, which is that there has been a lack of diversity across the board in the natural sciences, but particularly in physics and in astronomy. And if we are going to think purely about that, I don't know that we will ever get to solve that particular problem because that particular problem we've been quote unquote thinking about in various ways for a very long time. And we've made some progress, but uh, most people are not satisfied with the amount of progress that we had. So I'm gonna treat this like any other science question, right? Who gets to do science? Let's start by actually understanding what science we want to do and why we want to do it. I'm going to take um, the only approach I know for answering such questions, which is that of an experimental particle physicist, which is what I did for the first 25 years of my career. And that talks very much around having a vision that is going to extend over roughly two decades for building a machine that is going to deliver information that actually allows you to answer fairly fundamental questions, right? And various fields will have different time scales for this, but high energy physics, it's typically around 10 years to build something and around 10 years to get enough data out of it to actually uh, get to a fundamental answer to the question. It can be a little bit less depending on the project, sometimes a little bit more like with the Large Hadron Collider, right? So the first thing that we do is we start by imagining a project that is going to appeal to people around the world. And we do that uh, because we need the skill sets of people from around the world generally and their money uh, in order to actually put this together. Uh, we also think that it should be a deep enough question to justify this much time and effort by this many smart people that in fact it's not going to be so directed that it will answer just one question or two questions we anticipate that even if we were to be so lucky as to answer those questions, that in fact it will simply raise other questions, possibly deeper questions, going forward into uh, the next century. Uh, we've understood for some time now that we're going to have to make maximal use of computers because of their ability to expand the human intellect in order to actually get at the science. Uh, this one is one that's only been, I think, in the last generation, very important to how we ask how do we answer the question that we put forward? And that is that we are getting away from simply saying science for science sake. That is, we do this because it's placing us somewhere in the cosmology. Uh, human beings know what their place in the universe is. All of which is true philosophically, but it's not very exciting to enough people now that we can actually use that alone to justify why we would spend one to 10 or more billion dollars in order to produce an instrument in order to answer questions. So we have to get to more direct impact in terms of what the science is actually doing and how we do the science actually determines why that impact we think is going to be important to a larger number of people than may have been typically the case, say, th uh, two or three decades ago. Uh, that necessitates that we have to include citizen science 
as a part of the project in a pretty essential way. That is, we do have to have people other than scientists simply talking about why this is interesting and how they can get involved. Here's why we know that. There are a number of studies that have been done by social scientists over the years which actually talk about why the interest in science, quote unquote, uh, by society has been going down over time. Uh, people connect this to some of the things that they hear about the um, reducing of uh, respect for expertise of all kinds uh, in society, particularly uh, in American society. But in fact, there is something that's separately different about interest in science. And it's, uh, this is one book that's come out quite recently, actually, to talk about uh, studies that have been done by social scientists in the UK of people who are in the UK, but who started from points all over the world, uh, from Asia, from Africa, from South America, and what they think about science and who gets to do science. And it's represented pretty much by what you see as the comment there from one of the, uh, one of the respondents who is from Sierra Leone, where he talks about uh, the top 10 places that he would actually visit. Somehow I lost my pointer, here it is. Uh, and what he said basically is that a science museum would be nowhere on that list. And when the person who was asking the question said, why is that? He answered with, you can't connect with it, right? Science and science museums are only for people who do science. And that isn't most people, obviously, was the, was the implication of that. And so the question is that even for informal science, the things that we think we build simply to introduce science to people who we think are going to be as excited about it as people who actually do science, are finding that it's harder and harder to make that message actually resonate with people. Opportunities to interact with, learn about, speak about, laugh about science are marked by structural inequalities that are built into our society and they are built in in such a way that they mirror and reproduce the social advantages that actually lead people to be able to do science. Again, you know, this is not me making a pronouncement about it, right? You can, you can look at, and I can give you uh, examples of links if you want to go and, and look at the social studies on this. Uh, because of my, one of my jobs, which is Dean of Diversity and Faculty Development at Yale, uh, I've had the opportunity to actually try and understand a little bit more about what it is that has not made it easy for us to actually, quote unquote, solve the problem of bringing a broader set of people into the institution at the level of postdocs, graduate students, and faculty. Okay, and so the question is that if we actually have not succeeded in putting out the message that everyone is interested in science because it, first of all, speaks to it, and at, there is a level some level at which everyone has the ability to actually contribute to it, then in fact we have lost a pretty crucial piece of the message that going forward can lead to pretty catastrophic things. As someone who's old enough to have actually lobbied pretty strongly with the public for the superconducting super collider back in the 90s, I can tell you that there wasn't a single person I talked to, and I talked to thousands in public forums, uh, gardeners clubs, Kiwani clubs, any number of venues where they could send me to talk about it in Texas, uh, I was willing to go, as were a number of other people who were young and enthusiastic about the project. The public never once cared about the dollar amount. They simply didn't think anything that the government did could be done for less than billions of dollars. That wasn't important. What they wanted to know was, why should a citizen of Texas be interested in having this facility in Texas? Now, there are lots of reasons why they thought of themselves why it would be important, right? Some people thought we were building Star Trek technology. Some people thought, well, you know, smart people are interested in this and they're going to bring other smart people to live in Texas and that's good for... There are a number of reasons why on their own they thought about it. But they had not heard from the scientific community a reason why they would be personally interested in what the outcome was. And consequently, they didn't vote for the people who actually would have made it possible to keep that project in Texas. They liked the idea that there was going to be lots of money coming in, and there was lots of money coming in for the International um, Space Station, for example, which was also uh, headquartered in Houston at the time. Uh, but they hadn't heard that about the SSC. And so when that went away, guess what? 
there wasn't any political response to it, right? And it's because nobody actually understood why it is that people who were in that state should actually think that the science that was being done was important. Now we had explained some of the things that we were going to do in terms of Higgs physics and so forth, but really uh, we needed a different approach. And that approach needed to actually make an assumption, I think, that we could actually have people involved in that project in a way that actually made it possible for them to answer that question for themselves with real information. But here's another reason, right? The consequences are likely impactful throughout society. So this came uh, just recently from the National Science Foundation. In the year 2022, uh, blacks in this country earned uh, just a bit over a percent of all of the doctorates in mathematics and statistics and in computer science, and just a little bit under 2% of the doctorates in chemistry and in engineering disciplines, okay? Now, the data for the annual survey of earned doctorates show that in that same year, uh, 2,600 African Americans earned doctorates from U.S. universities, and that was the highest number ever recorded. But you'll notice that there are some fields that are missing from the percentages there. And that's because of the 1,800 2022 doctorates issued to U.S. citizens or permanent residents, those that were issued in particle physics, nuclear physics, optical sciences, or astronomy, and uh, two other fields, subfields, not a single one of them went to an African American. Now we can argue about whether maybe there was one and it got missed, right? But we're talking about numbers that are really fantastically small. Uh, this because is, I mean, shocking because, you know, at this very institution in the mid 80s, we graduated a number of African Americans in particle physics and nuclear physics. Uh, who have all, as far as I know, gone on to faculty positions at universities around the country. And so the fact that we actually have gone backwards in terms of what these numbers are, again, is indicative of the fact that we have not done, and by we, I mean collectively as a society, have not done a good job of actually understanding how we convince people that they can be part of science, they can actually do science, whether that science is done in the way that we as PhDs or PhDs to become think about it is not the most important question, right? It is actually understanding how we bring people into the enterprise. And so that's what I want to talk about. Uh, so again, we go back to the fundamentals. What is the science about? Well, I'm going to talk particularly about a science which everyone should intrinsically find of interest, which is that the universe itself is the laboratory. Right? The source is not something that we have to build. It actually is raining data down on us all the time. And we understand that that data tells us something about the constituents of the universe. Uh, I borrowed this slide, slide from Matt Strassler about 10 years ago, in which he basically lays out the case for how it is that astronomical observations have provided evidence to date for pretty fundamental uh, determinations of what the universe actually consists of. Right? It gives us our firmest understanding of the existence of dark matter and dark energy, non-zero neutrino masses, suggested phase transitions uh, leading to inflation, uh, best constraints on alternative theories of gravity, that is, you know, the fact that general relativity actually works. And you can look on the uh, left side and you can see from red, which is not very well known, to green, which we actually have pretty, com pretty uh, high confidence in, that all of these measurements that we make can tell us answers to questions that you would think in and of themselves are impossible to actually explore in the laboratory. That is, actually, we can say something with pretty high confidence that works across the universe for a number of these, of these uh, observations that have been made. And again, have pretty high confidence that they work because we look at them from multiple directions and we find consistency. And then we have theoretical models that actually tell us that, in fact, that's what we should expect to see. So the expansion history of the universe depends, as, as uh, indicated on the previous chart, on the densities of its various constituents. The expansion rate varies with cosmic time. Um, the density of radiation matter and dark energy dilute with that expansion at different rates, and this causes the universe to fall into separate epochs, which are characterized by different expansion rates. Uh, the uh, Friedman or Robertson um, Lemaitre Walker model actually spells that out pretty well. But the main thing is that 
it is measurable. And it's measurable, again, from things that everybody can actually, quote unquote, see. That is the night sky. Uh, we have to measure it in pretty precise ways, but um, the technology to do that has been made readily available um, at pretty high cost, but readily available over the last 20 years or so in ways that are going to revolutionize our ability to answer questions like the ones that are on the previous page over and over again with data sets that, again, are coming from a source that is always on. So, um, Starting right around 2002, 2003, there was a determination that one way to get at this information was to build a telescope, and that that would be the fundamental physics discovery machine from the 2020s on, and that the biggest discovery potential is a time domain survey. That is something that actually stares at the sky for a long enough period of time to actually see changes that occur in the sky on periods from night, that is day, to week, to months, to years, and would do it over a pretty wide set of uh, fields on the sky, that is areas of the sky, with a pretty fast cadence in order to actually determine whether something is changing over pretty, fairly short time periods, and would go to fairly faint magnitudes, that is look over a large fraction of cosmic time for the universe's existence. That resulted in something that's called the LSST Science Book. At that time, LSST starred for Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, uh, that has changed. We kept the acronym, but changed the, the meaning of the words underneath it. But the uh, science case was built up over about eight years of time by people who were pretty dedicated to answering the question, is it possible to make a telescope which is able to address all of the fundamental questions in particle physics, or at least most of them, and at the same time would actually be able to incorporate as part of the study uh, a number of questions having to do with astronomy, astrophysics, and cosmology. And the qu answer to that question is that you could come up with one design, that is one physical design, one telescope that was located in one spot on Earth that would actually address the large majority of such questions. And that was convincing enough that in the last decadal survey, this project called LSST was the number one project picked by the survey to be built. And of course, it then immediately happened that money flowed in order to construct it. And this is what it constructed. So this is a picture from last year, well, about a year and a half old now, uh, of a telescope unlike any other telescope ever built with the most powerful camera that's ever been conceived for astronomy. It's located in um, Chile at the southern end of the Atacama Desert. So it's not very high, but it is extremely dry which is great for astronomy. Water vapor pretty much ruins most measurements that you want to make. Uh, it's not very large in terms of the sizes of mirrors that you hear about today, which are tens of meters. This is, this is less than 10 meters. Uh, but it does have an extremely wide field of view, the widest of any telescope existing. Uh, that field of view, in fact, is equivalent to about 40 full moons on the sky. There's no telescope that has such a single pass picture taking ability. And it's extremely high resolution, about 3.2 billion pixels, which means that you would need to cover half a basketball court with high definition TVs in order to see one single full resolution image. And of course, this will take thousands. Uh, the color, colors that we are able to be sensitive to are six filters, which cover the full visual range and a little bit of the, uh, the near infrared. Now the mission for such a telescope, again, to do a time domain survey, is that you need to have it on sky for a pretty, a pretty long period of time, in this case, a decade. And so the observatory, which you see here, houses the telescope that will uh, donate the entire, entirety of its observing time over the first decade to what's now called the legacy survey of space and time. The fact that we have the telescope, however, as I said, is something that you quote unquote pay for, right? People who are smart engineers, technicians, and scientists spend a lot of time figuring out how to get the design exactly right and to make sure that the design that you have actually meets the specifications to do the science. But it is something that pretty much any nation in the world could have put together, right? It's a question of having the willpower and the necessary dollars to flow. So what I want to say by this is that this didn't require 
particular uh, expertise in the sense of only this person in the world could have actually come up with the idea and then actually worked out how to make it happen, right? This is not an inspiration of someone who is going to get a Nobel Prize for discovering this is how you put together the optimal telescope for surveys. This is really the work of literally hundreds of people who put their ideas together, put their heads together to figure out how to make those ideas actually become reality. In other words, it is a community project, not an individual inspiration. But this part actually is a lot fewer people. That is, in order to make this, we need more than just a science instrument that is dedicated to discovery. This also has to have built into it as part of the project from the very beginning with the same level of emphasis as you did for the technical details of how to design and then implement the telescope itself. The ability to do data mining and convert data into knowledge. Uh, we also had a very profound interest early on in understanding what the science is that would certainly interest any number of people, whether they quote unquote were interested in dark energy, dark matter, solar system surveys or not, which is, as I'll, I'll talk about, uh, the ability to identify near Earth objects which are potentially hazardous to society, uh, to civilization in fact. And then STEM education and public engagement, uh, which includes citizen science. And so you'll notice that it is on the same footing here as exactly everything else. The science mission, this is an essential piece of the science mission. The data, cyber infrastructure, this is an essential piece of deciding what that cyber infrastructure has to be. Uh, STEM education and public engagement actually seems as though it's talking just about maybe the set of people who are uh, going to be interested in hearing about reading this in the New York Times, say, or uh, Scientific American, and that's not the case. What we really mean here is how do we actually do STEM education for actually getting access to the data and then turning that data into knowledge for the entire set of people on planet Earth. So that includes the public, but it also includes undergraduates, it includes high school students, it includes postdocs, it includes postbacs, it includes an entire set of people who might have an interest in doing science here intrinsically because if it's possible for them to do it, there is a way in which it can be done. That in and of itself is maybe something that has not come across in any of the LSST talks that you might have heard to date, right? But this was an essential piece that was built in very early on as part of the design of the project itself. Okay, well the science piece is pretty straightforward. For example, type 1a supernova can be calibrated to act as standard candles, which means we can look at distances as a function of redshift with them. Uh, we think that quasars can similarly be calibrated in order to yield distances for comparison to the type 1a predictions. And the difference with LSST is not that realization, it's in the fact that there will be something like 10 million quasars discovered. So almost anything that you think about that can be done as cosmological tracers, you can do with LSST much better than you can do with any number of things that have ever been done before, simply by the sheer magnitude of the data set that's going to be produced by the telescope. Now that in and of itself is important, but what's also important is that the fact that you know that that's true, or, you can, or that you can depend on it, means that people are going to be thinking about different ways in which you can actually get the science done. So here's an example, right? In 2005, there was a congressional mandate made to NASA that called for the discovery of 90% of all objects that were Earth, crossing, or Earth orbit crossing uh, to diameters down to 140 meters. 140 meters basically is the size of something that destroys completely a city if it falls on one. The Rubin Observatory expects to begin survey operations in 2025 that will make a major contribution to the completeness requirement because if you ask NASA how far they've gotten with this, it's maybe about 50%, maybe about 50%. And that's of course because when Congress made the mandate, they conveniently forgot to actually provide the money to actually carry out that science, so it never got done. Uh, so it's been piecemeal from time to time. But it is a byproduct of the design of the Rubin telescope that in fact we can actually make this really complete to about 
In fact, right now we're expecting to get close to 99%. And that's because the fact that, again, you know the instrument exists and that the data set will be there means that people have come up with different ways to actually get at using that data to turn it into knowledge. So, for example, um, if you were looking at the New York Times, you would have seen back in August there was an announcement of a new software package called Helio Link 3D. And what Helio Link 3D is, is, uh, is designed to do is specifically to take Rubin LSST data and use far fewer images, about half the number of images, in order to determine the orbits of asteroids. As it turns out, of course, the hardest part of this is that you only get a few views of something that's moving across the sky very rapidly, and you have to take those few views and turn it into a Keplerian orbit. That turns out to be extremely difficult to do. You've got a pretty short lever arm for something that actually um, uh, uh, has to um, has to be traced accurately enough in order to determine whether or not that orbit actually intersects the Earth's orbit at all, and if so, whether it does so at times when the Earth is likely to actually be there. And so the way in which this has, has proceeded in the past usually required something like four images per night on that part of the sky, something that's really expensive to do. Telescope time is some of the most precious time there is actually for any, uh, any aspect of science. Uh, by reducing that to two, uh, we've actually shown, not me, but uh, the people who are working on this, have actually shown that there is an implementation in C++ that can actually carry this out with simulated LSST data showing that you get to more than 98% of the potentially discoverable main belt asteroids and 97% of the near-Earth objects uh, identified, that is, of the ones that are known. And just within one month, they were actually able to take data from a, an existing telescope and show that they could actually discover new asteroids with only half the data necessary for the old methods of doing it. So what I want to say about this is just that, again, the motivation here to actually come up with a new methodology for mining data actually comes from the fact that you understand that there's going to be so much data that if you're not much faster and efficient at how to turn that into knowledge, that in fact the mission will not succeed in getting out all the science that's potential, potentially there. Now, uh, the discovery in four key areas, time domain science, solar system census, mapping the Milky Way, dark energy, dark matter. Uh, these are things that I suspect, you know, just given that you have KIPAC here, you've heard about this uh, all before. So I'm not gonna spend time uh, going through those, although I'm happy to talk about it if people like. But what I do wanna talk about is the, the system. Uh, I said that all parts of a whole had to actually be consistent with the entire mission, which includes the ability to actually have science distributed among people who are not, quote unquote, generally referring to themselves as scientists. A worldwide population, in fact, that can observe the database with simultaneous investigations that are done by them without depending on a filter of having a set of scientists who have said, this is the piece of data where there might be something interesting for you to look at. Data mining, rather than classic observing, means that, you know, for an example, uh, there should no longer be first year, we don't use freshmen anymore, first year courses in astronomy which have people necessarily going out to observatories, because you may not have an observatory or a telescope in order to look through. But it shouldn't be necessary. There will be pictures of the sky, of the southern sky at least, which actually has all the information in it that you would see by taking that data yourself through a telescope. So you can spend more time, if you wish, training people about how that data was actually taken, but the actual data itself exists for people to do their own measurements, and you can do any number of measurements that you would have done on the sky, right? Now you can't do things like look at the moon and the phases of, of Venus, but pretty much anything else, you can actually have students who are just starting out in astronomy actually take the data and figure out how to make measurements on pictures to actually do astronomy. Um, the reason we can do that, of course, is that we have it as a goal that LSST is going to be the world's search engine for the optical sky over a vast stretch of the universe's history. Those are fancy words. Um, it's actually... <laughs> 
not possible to look at the words and say how feasible that actually is. Okay, so let me tell you some of the things that go into actually being able to make that statement without laughing or saying that it's simply hype in order to sell a project. Right, so the first is that there's going to be a stream of 10 million time domain events per night, which is available to everyone with an internet connection. Um, that gets distributed over a network within 60 seconds of observation. An entire night's observation will be available the next morning for every night in which the, uh, in which the telescope is operating. That produces a catalog of billions, tens of billions of objects, 20 billion galaxies, 17 billion stars, trillions of single epic events. Everything that changes on the night sky every two to three nights will actually be in the data set. So the active universe, and it is very active, will have things that are blinking on and off. Sometimes they blink only once, and if you missed it, because you weren't searching at that part of the sky with a telescope at that time, it's missed until somebody happens to actually come across another one. In this case, that never happens anymore, right? If uh, you have to now be unlucky, even if something only goes off once and then never happens again for 400 years, it should be in the data set as long as, we, uh, as, long as it occurs during these 10 years when we're looking. Uh, 30 trillion force sources produced annually accessible through online databases. Very deep co-added images, almost as deep as, as produced by the Hubble telescope. And then services and computing resources at what are called data access centers in order to enable people to come up with their own custom processing and analysis. Again, sounds like something that's pretty difficult. How do we actually make something like that happen? Well, uh, the first is that you have a number of tools and interfaces and learning experiences and adaptations to those learning experiences which actually improve with time. That is, as I said, it's not enough for us to actually, quote unquote, have the people who are scientists attached to the project produce science. That is true, that will happen as, as with any project. But there is a dedicated set of people who are actually looking at how we make it possible for other people to do discoveries on their own. And incorporating their experiences, good or bad, into making the next versions of these. So for example, that produces one of the things is the nightly alert stream. That is, you can't look at all this data. Uh, there's no pipeline that's big enough to actually deliver it to you that anybody would actually be able to afford on their own. But there are alert streams that you will be able to subscribe to in much the same way as you subscribe to a podcast in which every night the alert broker will go through, siphon the data to say, show me every potential supernova that went off in the sky last night. And it will be there. Show me every potential exoplanet that is actually in the database. Again, um, that will actually be an alert stream that has been written up by someone who is expert to actually deliver the potential data for you to look at and do what you wish. The project maintains what's called the Rubin Science Platform to enable data analysis that is co-located with the data. That is, you don't just get the data by itself and say, good luck, do what you can with it. There is actually a set of tools which are set to go with the data set that gets distributed along with it to help you with analysis, again, that you want to do. Now, there are three aspects for interacting with the data itself, um, all based on, of course, uh, the latest computing tools that, that have great user interfaces. Uh, a web API for remote programmatic access, if you are uh, an aficionado that knows how to do this. But the main thing is that all of these tools have dedicated teams behind them, which are working at the same level as the teams that are maintaining the integrity of the telescope hardware itself. Okay. So it's not something that we simply put out there and then, again, people either can use it or not. There is real feedback, there is real design, and there are changes that are implemented on the basis of what happens. So um, that leads to the ability to look at 10 terabytes per night, 60 petabytes over a decade, hundreds of petabytes, something like five to 600, after processing and, and Monte Carlo simulations, all of which will actually be accessible to, again, anyone, as long as they have an internet connection. Now, in order to support that, we need more than just money. This is a lot of people's time and effort uh, and dedication in understanding, again, how to generate the feedback that's necessary to correct or improve the system over time. And that leads to what 
is referred to as the Elicity ecosystem, which consists of two parts, uh, sorry, three parts. Uh, so the first is the Rubin project, which is the part of the project that actually builds and operates the observatory systems that carry out the survey. The next are the science collaborations, which is a community roughly of about 2,500 who are individuals working on producing science. And then there is the Discovery Alliance, formerly called the LSST Corporation. The LSST Corporation, as I said, was an essential piece of defining what this mission was because it is the body of people that actually not only came up with the original design that I told you, but also made the science case that led to uh, the existence of the project in terms of becoming the number one um, science decadal survey uh, 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 experiment. But it is also the now new coalition of 30 plus member institutions that's going to increase over time that supports the science goals in their entirety. So I'll talk about how that goes, but again, for each part of this ecosystem, there's a way in which we can actually spell out uh, through the designs, all of which you can actually see on the websites, um, as to what happens. All right, so for education and public outreach, the goals are explicitly broadening participation to include a large and diverse audience, incorporating evidence-based evaluation of participant incomes, again, uh, outcomes, and then making LSST a resource for content creators and education researchers. Uh, so the way you do that is, of course, you can't just have astronomers and physicists working to produce the data. You actually have to have education researchers who are part of determining what's the best way in order to make use of the data in order to come up with educational projects at any level of understanding that you want to be particularly interested in at that time. It's also true that the learning experiences for each user group uh, actually get fed back through some of those very same user groups in order to understand, again, what is the effectiveness of what we're doing, but with specific goals in mind, right? And so if we actually ask for experiments that are going to be done, of course there are experiments that are done, as you expect, that are about the physics. There are also experiments that are done that are explicitly around whether or not we actually are uh, influencing the number of uh, underrepresented minorities that are connected to the science that is provided by LSST, whether or not we are in fact producing any changes in the workforce that is directly attached to the, to the project, and whether or not we're having ancillary effects on the people who then, of course, are not working just for LSST, but are working for universities like Stanford or Yale. Uh, the fact is that each of these things in and of themselves requires support, and only a portion of that support can actually come financially from, say, the federal government. The rest of it has to come in some other way, okay? And so I'll talk about why that means that we need to have all three pieces of the ecosystem in order to make this happen, right? But let's talk about the second piece right now, which are the science collaborations. These are the things that are fairly traditional in the sense that, of course, you're going to have different collaborations that are interested in different parts of the science mission that is available who are going to be looking at this. And we sort of think of them as mixtures, again, of mostly graduate students and postdocs, some senior faculty members who are acting as leaders. Uh, but this is something that's a little different. Right? It's set up around each of these. The uh, dark energy science collaboration is the one that's most advanced, but each of the science collaborations um, um, that exist is going to have the same structure included, which is an analysis working group and led by a, a, an analysis coordinator team, a technical working group that works at how we actually produce the uh, technical aspects to the data that are necessary for analysis, and then a computing and simulation working group that talks about how we maximize computing tools for the use of the group in and of itself for uh, their, their own science. But again, also in connection and collaboration with the EPO team. So uh, this means that you can have people who move around between various areas or who stick in one area that may not be, again, the traditional area. So, one of the hard things about experimental particle physics in the 1980s, for example, was how do we support people who are really, really good at making trigger systems? 
they're not that interested in publishing tons of papers, but they are really expert at electronics, they're really experts at hardware design, they're really experts at how to make use of, uh, optimal use of accelerator data in order to actually capture what's really essential. And if you think about it, none of the traditional ways that we support career trajectories tended to include such people, right? You could work at a national lab, but you were very often not going to be chosen as a faculty member at a top university. And if you moved to something that wasn't a top university, you were going to be usually overwhelmed with teaching and not able to directly contribute in the thing that you were strongest at. Okay, so we explicitly have ways now for people who are technically astute, great at computing, but interested in the science, but not necessarily going to be leading the science themselves to actually be fully included as part of getting the science out. This means that we can attract a larger swath of humanity into the actual quote unquote doing of the science because they've actually got roles which are just as important as those who are going to be leading the next paper that goes into nature or science. Uh, they're absolutely essential, but they're bringing in expertise that you don't necessarily get if you are on the traditional, say, PhD path. And this is something that I think all of us who are very concerned about AI, I'm sure you've heard about it here as much as any place else. Uh, every place is very interested in not being left behind in using AI. And one of the things that we've realized about uh, this, not just at Yale, but I'm sure at other places, is that it's not enough to simply produce AI experts who will be service oriented towards uh, caring for people in sciences. We will actually need people who are trained in both science and in AI and machine learning in order to actually get the most out of the science that can happen. If you simply say, I want to bring somebody in and they can teach me how to do something, you don't actually optimize because what they produce for you is a tool that again is not necessarily the tool that incorporates what you know about the science best. And again, um, uh, it's necessary for us to convince people who again might have an interest in the science but are not necessarily, not necessarily going to go through leading, quote unquote, writing papers, but who want to contribute to actually getting the science out. That leads us to the Discovery Alliance, right? That's an independent, privately funded nonprofit that is intended to transform the societal impact of Rubin LSST. So where do the other funds that you can't get from the federal government come from? Um, they're being done by innovative programs that emphasize the networking and community that's necessary to actually have people support each other in getting this done. That also means that we do have to have some amount of funding that comes from foundations. But the idea is to develop a model for the new normal, that is inclusive participation in order to produce excellence in astronomy and in physics. What are some of the things that we do that are specifically around that? Well, first is that we should see that this number includes all of the universities that you expect to see, right? Harvard and Yale and Caltech and Stanford and MIT but it should also include some universities that you don't normally see as part of these collaborations. Uh, so that we're adding in this year in terms of what are called expansion sites. So that is minority serving institutions, those uh, serving populations of indigenous people in say the Midwestern states, uh, Plain states, uh, as well as, as HBCUs. All of which is signed on now. There are a half dozen of those that are signed up already. Um, that are just being pulled in to the management um, of the, of the uh, Discovery Alliance. And we've already committed something like $25 million of foundation funding to programs through 2026 with a fundraising team that's actually established now to go out and get more. What we do is to organize member departments and institutes in order to achieve things that a single institution has trouble doing on its own. So here's an example, uh, what's called LINK. Um, the LSST Interdisciplinary Network for Collaboration and Computing, which creates and shares analysis tools for key LSST science goals. One institution might be able to write a grant, which uh, the NSF has, for example, just put out um, such a call, but it would have trouble doing it if it has trouble also establishing workshops. That is, you have produced a tool, you now have to figure out how to educate people on how to use it. 
training and mentoring of future scientific leaders is explicitly, uh, um, explicitly designed in part of what Lincoln's intended to do. That is, how do people become good mentors? That's typically not something that we actually formally teach people to do as part of graduate education. But we now have a way in which we can actually say there will be workshops that talk about what it means to be a good mentor. What does it mean to be a good mentor to a participatory audience that is inclusive? Again, inclusive mentoring is definitely not something that we have typically been taught. Um, you know, as a dean of science, I can tell you for certain, right? Mentoring is not one of the things that we particularly do well unless it happens by accident. There are people who are great mentors, but the fact is we don't actually train people to do that. And for the first time, we will actually, for astronomy and astrophysics, have a program which is actually able to do that, again, assuming people have an interest. And then um, ways in which we provide tools which open the discovery space for people, again, who are not part of just the traditional PhD track in order to learn how to be a scientist. So uh, I won't go through any of this, but again, each of these pieces is essential, right? Training, training the next generation of scientific leaders who actually do understand the importance of being inclusive and who have some training about how to increase the diversity of their audiences so that hopefully in the next generation we won't have people who say, I understand that it's a problem to attract a diverse graduate audience. I just don't know how to do it. Well, there actually aren't any experts out there to go to, to actually tell you that. So we want to produce them. Uh, we want to have data to solve problems like identifying transients that are exploding. Again, since we don't actually have a large data set that includes transients like that, because most telescopes have very small uh, 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 views on the sky, we actually have to produce a new set of tools that are explicitly meant to look for things that are changing on the sky and not changing in a way that is regular. They can be irregular or they can happen just once. And then finally, we need to actually create new ways in which we actually collaborate with each other. That is, uh, right now, this morning, I was on a Zoom call at 7.30 with those of the Dark Energy Science Collaboration who are having a virtual science collaboration meeting this entire week. But, you know, it's, uh, it's February, so I'm here. Uh, so the idea, though, is that that is just part of what we can actually do in order to make it easier for people to sign on from wherever they happen to be so that we don't all have to be sitting physically in the same place to get things done. Uh, this is harder than it sounds, right? When we talk about having what we mean are workshops where we intend to actually have a bunch of people work on a specific problem for a focused period of time. That used to happen by having everybody come to a location, turn off their cell phones, and sit together for a day or two days or three days until they had come up with a piece of code, for example, that solves a problem. What we're doing is actually sponsoring ways in which we experiment in, in how people can do that virtually and they can sign in for a bit of time, use some of the tools that are there. Again, there's Slack. I hate Slack, but you have to use it. Uh, but we can do better, right? We can come up with tools that actually do most of what Slack does, but does it in a way that actually makes it possible for people to communicate more effectively. But again, there's no one you can actually say, write an NSF grant that's going to figure out how to get that done. So we will need foundation funding that supports that. We also do produce code, actually, that is things like uh, frameworks for scalable spatial analysis, that is how do you scale up over very large data sets. Uh, how do we do photo Z infrastructure? Uh, time domain science itself needs to be uh, rethought. And then, of course, faint object detection for things that are, again, only seen once. All right, so right at the end, I'll just go very quickly through the fact that the way in which we actually do this training, we get it out, is that we actually have to fund people to take on the job of doing the learning and then carrying out the teaching, right? So there are Catalyst Fellowships, which are basically postdocs, but there are postdocs that, first of all, are five years, and over that period of time, at least one of those years has to be spent at one of our expansion sites. So you can imagine now that it might be difficult to have 
say, a His Hispanic serving institution that is able to join into LSST science. But we now have and are building a workforce in which at least some of the people can spend one year of their time helping build the science at that local institution at the same time as they're building their own case for a science that is allowing them to stay in the field over, um, over the long haul. Uh, we're also explicitly including support for social scientists. That is, people who are explicitly going to study, are we doing the right things? Are we making the right changes? These are all experimental models. These are not places where you can go and say, people have tried this before, they've done it this way, it's worked. They tried it this way, it didn't work. Everything that we do is experimental, and therefore it has to be evaluated in the way that social scientists tell us determines whether or not we're making successful inroads or not. Uh, there are particular fellowships that we can look at for graduate students, uh, which are essential to teaching astronomy students uh, skills for dealing with big data, specifically from LSST, but again, any large-scale survey would be uh, subject to many of the same kinds of techniques. And then finally, uh, support for, uh, for students at the undergraduate level, where we had priority access so far because of limited funding for uh, Discovery Alliance member institutions, but again, uh, the hope is to make this available to any number of institutions that are interested in joining in the mission. All right, so the summary. Uh, the ecosystem supports the entire scope of a 10-year construction project followed by a 10-year survey. Uh, I explicitly mentioned those numbers because, again, we're doing it for LSST, but the hope is that we realize what people in Europe, scientists in Europe, have already realized in other fields like computational biology which is that you need to build community in order to do this. This is explicitly what LIGO did, right? There was no gravitational wave community because there were no gravitational wave observatories. And they understood that it wasn't enough to simply build the instrument. You had to actually build a community to analyze the data, figure out how to actually turn the data into discoveries, and then would also be able to design the next generation of such experiments. I suspect that all of the big sciences are going to have to learn to do exactly the same thing when they're talking about things that are really big, really expensive, and take long periods of time. Integrating the values of a community into community building and making it explicitly talk about inclusive excellence is part of the ecosystem that is necessary to support doing a big science going forward. We simply are not going to be able to convince people, I suspect, that we will build another accelerator in this country if we are not along the line where we can show how we can pull in people from, again, all walks of life who have an intrinsic interest, right? I mean, all of you who do outreach understand that people have the interest. They just don't have any idea how they could ever do what you do. And it's actually possible for us to show them that. Uh, again, um, there are studies that have been done throughout Europe now in certain fields like computational biology that actually show through social science that it's possible to teach people community management. That is, it's possible to have people explicitly think about how to build communities of people which are diverse in every meaning of that word and actually have them contribute to the science and have people who are quote unquote scientists not feel as though they are somehow doing this out of the goodness of their heart. They're doing it because they actually see that it advances their ideas for how to get the best science out of the data that they're actually able to produce. And so what I hope I leave you with is this question, who gets to do science? Well, it may well be none of us in the future if we don't actually crack the problem of understanding how to actually include many more people in the doing of the science that we're actually able to carry out. Thank you. Well, I guess we, this is a, some thought-provoking discussion here, and we do have time for a few questions, so if you're uh, interested, go ahead and raise your hand. And... Yes, um, thank you so much for the presentation. It's excellent, by the way. Um, I was wondering, uh, based off of your closing comment on bringing big science to essentially hope everyone may be able, do you see this being the, the new standard going forward when you start thinking about uh, large uh, 
big data sets that are still coming online, like LSD and other, other telescopes? Well, I, you know, it's not what I think. I hope that we eventually convince people that it, it has to be something along those lines, uh, just because, you know, uh, you, you really do lose. Right? We lost leadership in experimental particle physics in this country, uh, and it wasn't just for one generation, right? It's gonna be multiple generations. We're still talking about building the next version of a large collider on American soil. And I can't imagine how that happens if we don't have a community of people who actually think there's a reason for building that beyond just the few hundred particle physicists who are really going to enjoy it. So, um, I, but I suspect that there, there's any number of large science projects that are very big, very time consuming, that take large communities of people in order to actually make them happen, that will find that it's, it's going to be necessary to have some version of this ecosystem that supports that large community. Otherwise, what tends to happen or what will increasingly intend to happen is that people will divide off and the projects themselves won't get the concentrated effort that's really necessary to bring out as much science as you could possibly get from, from the idea of, of how to do the big science in and of itself. If you kind of think um, in almost any aspect in which you have you know, knowledge working, right? If, you are convinced that a machine can do it better, then why would you encourage investment in that field? Now again, we all understand that if you use ChatGPT to write your code, uh, it does a really great job, right? It doesn't get the physics right, it gets the math horribly wrong, but it actually does okay enough to convince people who don't know the science that well that it's doing something. And the question is, is it really doing something or not? Again, we will have to make an argument that people are engaged enough in this to actually understand whether it's really telling you something truthful or not. So I, I, this is one way to make that argument, right? I don't know of any other that I expect will be effective, but if people have it, that's great. But I suspect you will have to do that. I, otherwise, I see the number of large projects that we're actually able to get politically supported will continue to decrease. And that will include the next big astronomy projects that are not funded by you know, billionaires. But even if you look in, in billionaires, the reason I was talking about computational biology, because again, if you look in the New York Times, you will have seen um, last month a bunch of billionaires who are basically saying, we're hiring scientists away from Harvard in order to do the science we think really needs to be done. And they're putting big money behind it, and they're actually succeeding in luring people away from, from faculty positions with the promise of big money um, sustained over some period of time. But guess what? The science that they want to do isn't necessarily the science that necessarily needs to be done, right? Because they're looking at getting return on investment at some point in his, you know, no matter what they say, they're looking at return on investment because the way you make a lot of money is you put money in that actually returns several fold over. So the fact is that there are real risks to not finding ways to involve community support for this because there are people who are going to actually divert the attention and the talent uh, that's necessary to, uh, that if you had it in a community you could actually succeed and if you don't then it tends to fall apart and go in different directions. Yes. Yeah, so how do you, you know, what are some of the things that you're <clears throat> thinking about doing to motivate scientists to like make this really high quality data when the next thing you do is you just like hand it out to everyone? So, um, <clears throat> as I said, we, we, we need to do some studies that show that we're succeeding at bringing people in. So there is, there's a belief I have, which is that um, we actually do learn from having different viewpoints and different ideas about how to get at answering particular questions. So when people ask me, for example, how do we convince scientists in the lab right now to use some of the new AI tools that are coming out, you know, my point is that it's not up to me to convince them, right? If the AI tools are actually effective, then they're going to get left behind if they don't use them. 
And so the question is, if we're actually improving the science that we can actually do, eventually that convinces the scientists to be involved in this. If you sort of say, well, we're just handing the data out, uh, in truth, you're never really doing that, right? And so I talked at lunch to, to the students about various ways in which you actually, even though we say we're doing that, that's not actually what's happening. So you think about it, 10 terabytes per night, who could actually receive all that? Nobody, right? And so what people are actually getting, if they look at the raw data, they can get access to it. It's a postage stamp on the sky. It's not nearly large enough to do any effective science with. But it is free, and it is available on the internet to everyone. So you have to go through these alert brokers to actually have some winnowing of the data into the things that are focused on the questions that you're interested in asking as part of that. So that will be very clear. People will use the alert brokers because they'll realize very quickly that if they're trying to do this on their own, looking at the raw data, that is too expensive and too time consuming to get enough of it to actually do anything that's really effective, except by extreme good fortune, right? And it's the same with uh, working with community. If you actually show that it's effective for people to actually do this, that they get more science out of doing it, then I don't think you have to convince them. Eventually, they, they come around because nobody likes to be left behind. Leo had a question, too. Yeah. It's, it's impressive to see the LSST coming to life here soon after, what, 20 years of time. And uh, you made a pretty compelling case, in my view, anyway, of the structure of having all of these different components. So I'd like maybe you can provide some kind of of how many people are involved in this and how is that growing in the dollar time you know, path to put something like this together? Uh, it's hard to estimate uh, in a way that is really good. So uh, that, you know, from a scientist perspective, we expect that there are exact answers to things. Uh, we all understand that that's not true, right? There's uncertainty involved in it. And the question is, is the uncertainty meaningful or not? The great thing about involving social scientists is that they're okay with dealing with uncertainty, right, uh, of the kind that I'm talking about here, which, which is to say that they are looking for ways to measure the actual impact. And then if you tried to say, is there an efficiency factor there, right? Could we have gotten that same impact by using fewer people? Uh, they would say that's not the right question to answer. Right? Uh, the right question to answer is, did you have a goal? Have you succeeded in actually being able to measure the goal? And then through the measurements, seeing that you have progress. If you try to estimate a price that's attached to that, that turned out to be very complicated to do. It's possible, but it goes along the lines of some of the things that economists have done, for example, to measure the impact on um, various policies for environment. It's actually possible to do, but it's Nobel Prize winning work to actually do that, to do those measurements, right? And people have won the Nobel Prize for actually understanding that you know, our environment total is about $40 trillion, right? There's a number, $42 trillion. So the question of how you got to that, well, that's decades of time by really high level people spending all of their effort in, tr in order to determine that. And it's not clear that that's what you need here, right? Uh, if you actually ask the question, you know, is it 2,500 people or not? Um, I'm not sure that I'm that interested in knowing the answer to that question because some of those 2,500 come by volunteer. Some of the 2,500 don't know that that's what they're doing, right? Uh, literally, they found an interesting problem because it was posted on a website and they decided to solve it. And in the process of solving it, they found that they made it easier for a whole bunch of other people they didn't know or care about to actually do science that was not, never on their minds when they thought about it. So there's a certain degree of serendipity, which is really hard to measure. And again, the social scientists kind of keep us focused that, right, if you really want all that detail, that's really expensive and very time consuming to get. If you just want to know are you effective or not, that we can actually do for you. And it can be done on the time scale that's relevant for, for the project. Hey, let's see, maybe time for one last. I think there's a question over there. No, yes, so I, um, 
was really impressed by like the breadth of how you're suggesting that we go beyond just like small the, the large institutions you normally talk about um, to a whole bunch of like HBCUs and other institutions mm -hmm. around the society. Do you think that that's broad enough? Like, and to some extent, you're only targeting folks that are in the education phase of their life at, at that point. Yeah, that's a great question, and yeah, the answer is it's not broad enough. Uh, we start with them because, you know, frankly, um, just in all honesty, right, you have to get money to do this, right? And the way you get money is you give something that is nice and shiny and identifiable to people who are going to give you the money. So the intent is actually to go beyond institutions like that. But if you say that we're doing this for this set of under-resourced institutions, that's an easy sell to foundations to actually provide uh, funding to get you started. I think once you have that in place, then obviously it would be terrific, and you know, hopefully we will figure out how to do this at the level of community colleges, uh, at GED programs, in prisons. There's any number of places where I think the same kinds of techniques of community building will actually be effective. And so my wife is very much involved in prison education. Um, and so a lot of the same things that she writes her grants around are exactly the same things that we're talking about doing here. But to, to be frank, we, we do it with these minority serving institutions because foundations want to see that or they like to see that and they, they will reward you for showing that you're doing it effectively. Okay, well, I think we've heard a good case that this will be a major issue for all large science programs. So we should go home and think about that. And let us hope that LSST, now Ruben, becomes a worked example of how to do this right. So let's thank our speaker again. And <laughs>